so I want to read to you. I've been called to it. And I know, I know that I'm going to get interrupted, but such is life. I've just got to go for it. If I don't start now, then I won't ever get it done because I'm always interrupted. That's not the point. Okay. The Toltec. Thousands of years ago, the Toltec were known through southern Mexico as women and men of knowledge. Anthropologists have spoken of the Toltec as a nation or race, but in fact, the Toltec were scientists and artists who formed a society to explore and conserve the spiritual knowledge and practices of the ancient one. They came together as masters, Nagul's, and students at the, I can't pronounce this word, it doesn't matter, Theolotion, the ancient city of the pyramids outside Mexico City, <clears throat> known as the place where man becomes God. Over the millennia, the Nagwals were fo forced to conceal the ancestral wisdom and maintain its existence in obscurity. European conquest coupled with the rampant misuse of personal power by a few of the apprentices made it necessary to shield the knowledge from those who were not prepared to use it wisely or who might intentionally misuse it for personal gain. Fortunately, the esoteric Toltec knowledge was embodied and passed on through generations by different lineages of Nagwals. Though it remained veiled in secrecy for hundreds of years, ancient prophecies foretold the coming of an age when it would be necessary to return the wisdom to the people. Now, Don Miguel Ruiz, a Nagual from the Eagle Knight lineage, has been guided to share with us the powerful, tol the powerful teachings of the Toltec. Toltec knowledge arises from the same essential unity of truth as all sacred esoteric traditions found around the world. Though it is not a religion, it honors all the spiritual masters who have taught on the earth. While it does embrace spirit, <clears throat> it is most accurately described as a way of life, distinguished by <clears throat> the ready accessibility of happiness and love. A Toltec is an artist of love, an artist of the spirit, someone who is creating every moment, every second, the most beautiful art, the art of dreaming. Life is nothing but a dream, and if we are artists, then we can create our life with love, and our dream becomes a masterpiece of art. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, introduction is titled The Master. Once upon a time, a master was talking to a crowd of people, and his message was so wonderful that everyone felt touched by his words of love. In the crowd there was a man who had listened to every word the master said. This man was very humble. He had a great heart, and he was so touched by the master's words that he felt the need to invite the master to his home. When the master finished speaking, the man walked through the crowd, looked into the eyes of the master, and told him, I know you are busy, and everyone wants your attention. I know you hardly have time to even listen to my words, but my heart is so open, and I feel so much love for you that I have the need to invite you to my home. I want to prepare the best meal for you. I don't expect you will accept, but I just had to let you know. The master looked into the man's eyes, and with the most beautiful smile, he said, Prepare everything. I will be there. Then the master walked away. At these words, the joy in the man's heart was strong. He could hardly wait to serve the master and to express his love for him. This would be the most important day of his life. The master was going to be with him. He bought the best food and wine, found the most beautiful clothes to offer as a gift to the master. Then he ran home to prepare everything to receive the master. He cleaned his entire house, prepared the most wonderful meal, and made the table look beautiful. His heart was full of joy because the master would soon be there. The man was waiting anxiously when someone knocked at the door. Eagerly, he opened the door, but instead of the master, he found an old woman. She looked into his eyes and said, I am starving. Can you give me a piece of bread? The man had a little disappointment because it was not the master. He looked at the woman and said, Please come into my house. He sat her in the place he had prepared for the master. He gave her the food he had made for the master, but he was anxious and could hardly wait for her to finish eating. The old woman was touched by the generosity of this man. She thanked him and left. The man had barely finished preparing the table for the master again when someone knocked at the door. This time it was another stranger who had tra traveled across the, d the desert. 
he, the stranger looked into the man's face and said, I am thirsty. Can you give me something to drink? The man was a little disappointed again because it was not the master. He invited the stranger into his home and sat him in the place he had prepared for the master. He served the wine he had intended to give the master. When the stranger left, the man again prepared everything for the master. Someone knocked at the door again. When the man opened the door, there stood a child. The child looked up at the man and said, I am freezing. Can you give me a blanket to cover my body? The man was a little disappointed because it was not the master, but he looked into the eyes of the child and felt love in his heart. Quickly he gathered the clothes he had intended to give the master, and he covered the child with the clothes. The child thanked him and left. The man prepared everything again for the master, and, again, and, and then he waited until it was very late. <clears throat> when he realized the master was not coming, he was disappointed. But right away he forgave the master. He said to himself, I knew I could not expect the master to come to to this humble home. Although he said he would come, something more important must have taken him elsewhere. The master did not come, but at least he told me he would, and this is enough for my heart to be happy. Slowly he put the food away, food away. he put the wine away, and he went to bed. That night he dreamed the master came to his home. The man was happy to see him, but he didn't know that he was dreaming. Master, you came, you kept your word. The master replied, yes, I am here. But I was here before. I was hungry, and you f fulfilled my need for food. I was thirsty, and you gave me wine. Oh, damn, this one always gets me. <laughs> <clears throat> I was cold, and you covered me with cloths. Whatever you do for others, you do for me. The man woke up, and his heart was filled with happiness because he understood what the master had taught him. <laughs> oh, dang, now I can't see. Hold on. <clears throat> Whew. the master loved him so much I thought I was good but I'm not yet <laughs> oh the master loved him so much that he s sent three people to give him the greatest lesson the master lives within everyone when you give food to one who is starving <clears throat> When you give water to one who is thirsty, when you cover the one who is cold, you give love to the master. Okay. Chapter one, the wounded mind. Perhaps you have never thought about it, but on one level or another, all of us are masters. We are masters because we have the power to create and to rule our own lives. Just as societies and religions around the world create incredible mythologies, we create our own. Our personal mythology is populated by heroes and villains, angels and demons, kings and commoners. We create an entire population in our mind, including multiple personalities for ourselves. Then we master the image we are going to use in certain circumstances. We become artists of of pretending and projecting our images and we master whatever we believe we are when we meet other people we classify them right away and assign them a role in our lives we create an image for others according to what we believe they are and we do the same thing with everyone and everything around us you have the power to create your power is so strong that whatever you believe be comes true you create yourself whatever you believe you are you are the way you are because that is what you believe about yourself your whole reality, everything you believe is your creation. You have the same power as any other human in the world. The main difference between you and someone else is how you apply your power, what you create with your power. You may be similar to others in many ways, but no one in the world lives her life the way you do. You have practiced all your life to be what you are, and you do it so well. You master what you believe you are. You master your own personality, your own beliefs. You master every action, every reaction. You practice for years and years, and you achieve the level of mastery to be what you believe you are. Once we can see that all of us are masters, we can see what kind of mastery we have. When we are children, we have a problem with someone, we get angry. For whatever reason, that anger pushes the problem away. We get the result we want. It happens a second time we react with anger, and now we know if we get angry, we push the problem away. Then we practice and practice until we become masters of anger. 
In the same way, we become masters of jealousy, masters of sadness, masters of self-rejection. All our drama and suffering is by practice. We make an agreement with ourselves, and we practice that agreement until it becomes a whole master. The way we think, the way we feel, and the way <clears throat> we act becomes so routine that we no longer need to put our attention on what we are doing. It is just by action-reaction that we behave a certain way. To become masters of love, we have to practice love. The art of relationship is also a whole mastery, and the whole way to reach mastery is to practice. To master a relationship is therefore about action. It is not about concepts or attaining knowledge. It is about action. Of course, to have action, we need to have some knowledge, or at least a little more awareness of the, ver of the way human humans operate. I want you to imagine that you live on a planet where everyone has the skin disease. For two or three thousand years, the people on your planet have suffered the same disease. The entire bodies are covered by wounds that are infected, and those wounds really hurt when you touch them. Of course, they believe this is normal psychologically, normal physiology of skin. Even the medical books describe this disease as a normal condition. When the people are born, their skin is healthy, but around three or four years of age, the first wounds start to appear. By the time they are teenagers, there are wounds all over their bodies. Can you imagine how these people are going to treat each other? In order to relate with one another, they have to protect their wounds. They hardly ever touch each other's skin because it is too painful. If by accident you touch someone's skin, it is so painful that right away she or he gets angry and touches your skin just to, ev just to get even. Still, the instincts to the instinct to love is so strong that you pay a high price to have a relationship with others. Well, imagine that a miracle occurs one day. You awake and your skin is completely healed. There are no wounds anymore and it doesn't hurt to be touched. Healthy skin you can touch feels wonderful because the skin is made for perception. Can you imagine yourself with healthy skin in a world where everyone has a skin disease? You cannot touch others because it hurts them, and no one touches you because they make the assumption that it will hurt you. If you can imagine this, perhaps you can understand that someone from another planet who came to visit us would have a similar experience with humans. But it isn't our skin that is full of wounds. What the visitor would discover is that the human mind is sick with a disease called fear. Just like the description of the infect infected skin, the emotional body is full of wounds. And these wounds are infected with emotional poison. The manifestation of disease of fear and anger, hate, sadness, envy, hypocrisy, and the result of the disease is all the emotions that make humans suffer. All humans are mentally sick and all are mentally sick with the same disease. We can even say that this world is a mental hospital. But this mental disease has been in the world for thousands of years. And the medical books, the psychiatrists, psychiatric books and psychology books describe the disease as normal they consider it normal but i can tell you it is not normal <laughs> i love that part when the fear becomes too great the reasoning mind starts to fail and can no longer take all those wounds with all the poison in psychology books we call this a mental illness we call it schizophrenia paranoia psychosis but these diseases are created when the reasoning mind is so frightened and the wounds so painful that it becomes better to break contact with the outside world. Humans live in continuous fear of being hurt, and this creates a big drama wherever we go. The way humans relate to each other is so emotionally painful that for no apparent reason we get angry, jealousy, jealous, envious, sad. To even say I love you can be frightening. But even if it's painful and fearful to have an emotional interaction, we still keep going. We enter into relationships, get married, have children. In order to protect our emotional wounds and because of our fear of being hurt, humans create something very sophisticated in the mind, a big denial system. In that denial system, we become the perfect liars. We lie so perfectly that we lie to ourselves and we can even believe our own lies. We don't even need to notice that we are lying. And sometimes, even when we know we are lying, we justify the lie and excuse the lie to protect ourselves from the pain of our wounds. <clears throat> the nana, the nana, I can do this, I swear. The denial system is like a wall of fog in front of our eyes that blinds us from seeing the truth. We wear social masks because it's too p painful to see ourselves or to let others see us as we really are. And the denial system lets us pretend that everyone believes what we want them to believe about us. 
we put up these barriers for protection to keep other people away. <clears throat> but those barriers also keep us inside, restricting our freedom. Humans cover themselves and protect themselves. And when someone says, you are pushing my buttons, it is not necessarily true. What is true is that you are touching a wound in his or her mind, and he or she reacts because it hurts. When you are aware that everyone around you has emotional wounds with emotional poison, you can easily understand the relationship of humans in what the Toltecs call the dream of hell. From the Toltec perspective, everything we believe about ourselves and everything we know about our world is a dream. If you look at any religion, <clears throat> religion's description of hell, it is the same as, as human society. The way we dream, hell is a place of suffering, a place of fear, a place of war and violence, a place of judgment and no justice, a place of punishment that never ends. There are humans versus humans in a jungle of predators, humans full of judgment, full of blame, full of guilt, full of emotional poison, envy, anger, hate, sadness, suffering. We create all these little demons in our minds because we have learned to dream hell in our own life. Each of us creates a personal dream from our own self, but the human before us created a big outside dream, the dream of human society. The outside dream, or the dream of the planet, is the collective dream of billions of dreamers. The big dream includes all the rules of society, its laws, its religions, its different cultures, and ways to be. All of this information stored inside our mind is like a thousand voices talking all at once. The Toltecs call this the mitote. The real, you, the real us is pure love. We are life. The real us has nothing to do with the dream. But the mitote keeps us from seeing what we really are. <sighs> when you see the dream from this perspective, and if you have the awareness of what you are, you see the nonsense behavior of humans, and it becomes amusing. What for everyone else is big drama, for you becomes a comedy. You can see humans suffering over something that is not important, that is not even real. But we have no choice. We are born in this society, we grow up in this society, and we learn to be like everyone else, playing nonsense all the time, competing with mere nonsense. Imagine that you could visit a planet where everyone has a different kind of emotional mind. The way they relate to each other is always in happiness, always in love, always in peace. Now imagine one day you awake on this planet and you no longer have wounds in your emotional body. You are no longer afraid to be who you are. Whatever someone says about you, whether they truly do, Whatever they do, you don't take it personally, and it doesn't hurt anymore. You no longer need to protect yourself. You are not afraid to love, to share, to open your heart. But no one else is like you. How can you relate with people who are emotionally wounded and sick with fear? When a human is born, the emotional mind, the emotional body is completely healthy. Maybe around three or four years of age, the four first wounds in the emotional body start to appear and get effect infected with emotional poison. But if you observe children who are two or three years old, you see how they behave. They are playing all the time. You see them laughing all the time. Their imagination is so powerful, and the way they dream is an adventure of exploration. When something is wrong, they react and defend themselves, but then they just let go and turn their attention to the moment again, to play again, to explore and have fun again. They are living in the moment. They are not ashamed of the past. They are not worried about the future. Little children express what they feel, and they are not afraid to love. The happiest moments in our lives are when we are playing like children, when we are singing and dancing, when we are exploring and creating just for fun. It is wonderful when we behave like a child because this is the normal human mind, the normal human tendency. As children, we are innocent, and it is natural for us to express love. But what has happened to us what has happened to the whole world, what has happened is that we are, when we are children, the adults are already have the mental disease and they are highly contagious. How do they pass this disease on to us to hook our attention and then they teach us to be like them. That is how we pass our disease to our children and that is how our parents, our teachers, our older siblings and all the society of sick people infected us with this disease. They hooked our attention and put information in our mind through repetition, and this is the way we learn. This is the way we program a human mind. The problem is the programming, the information we have stored in our mind. 
By hooking the attention, we teach a child a language, how to read, how to behave, how to dream. We domesticate humans the same way we domesticate a dog or any other animal, with punishment and reward. This is perfectly normal. What we call education is nothing but domestication of a human being. We are afraid to be punished, but later we are also afraid of not getting the reward, of not being good enough for mom or dad, sibling or teacher. The need to be accepted is born. Before that, we don't care whether we are accepted or not. People's opinions are not important. They are not important because we just want to play and we just want to live in the moment. The fear of not getting the reward becomes the fear of rejection. The fear of not being good enough for someone else is what makes us try to change, what makes us create an image. Then we try to protect that image according to what they want us to be, just to be accepted, just to have the reward. We learn to pretend to be what we are not, and we practice trying to be someone else, just to be good enough for mom, for dad, for the teacher, for our religion, for whatever. We practice and practice, and we master how to be what we are not. Soon we forget who we really are, and we start to live our image. We create not just one image, but many different images according to the different groups of people that we associate with. We create an image at home, an image at school, an image when we grow up. We create even more images. This is also true for a simple relationship between a man and a woman. The woman has an outer image that she tries to project to others, but then when she is alone, she has another self-image. The man also has an outer image and then an inner image, and by the time they are adults, the inner image and the outer image are so different that they hardly even match each other. In the relationship between a man and a woman, there are four images at least. How can they really know each other? They don't. They can only try to understand the image, but there are more images to consider. When a man meets a woman, he makes an image of her from his point of view, and the woman makes an image of the man from her point of view. Then he tries to make her fit the image he makes he makes for her, and she tries to make him fit the image and that she makes for him. And now there are six images between them. Of course, they are lying to each other. Even if they don't know they are lying to each other, their relationship is based on fear. It is based on lies. It is not based on truth because they cannot see through all that fog. In the period when we are little children, there is no conflict with the images we pretend to be. Our images are not really changed, challenged until we begin to interact with the outside world and no longer have our parents' protect, protection. This is why being a teenager is particularly difficult. Even if we, if, if we are prepared to support and defend our image, as soon as we try to project our image to the outside world, the world fights back. The outside world starts proving to us not just privately but publicly that we are not what we pretend to be let's take the example of teenage boys who pretend to be very intelligent he goes to the debate at school and the debate someone who is more intelligent and more prepared wins the debate and makes him look ridiculous in front of everyone he will try to explain and excuse and justify his image in front of his peers he will also be he will he will be so kind to everyone and will try to save his image in front of them but he knows he is lying. Of course, he tries his best to break, not to break in front of his peers, but as soon as he is alone, he sees himself in the mirror. He goes and breaks the mirror. He hates himself. He feels that he is so stupid that he is the worst. There is a big discrepancy between the inner image and the outer image that he tries to project to the world. The bigger the discrepancy, the more difficult the adaptation to society's drama and dream and the less love he will have for himself between the image he pretends to be and the inner image when he is alone are lies and more lies both images are completely out of touch with reality they are false but he doesn't see that maybe someone else can see that but he only, but he is completely blind his denial system tries to protect protect the wounds, but the wounds are real, and he is hurting because he is trying so hard to defend an image. When we are children, we learn that everyone's opinions are important, and we rule our lives according to those opinions. A simple opinion from someone can put us deeper into hell, an opinion that is not even true. You look ugly. You are wrong. You are stupid. Opinions have a lot of power <coughs> over the nonsense behavior of people who live in hell. <coughs> that is why we need to hear that, that we are good, that we are doing well, <coughs> that we are beautiful. <clears throat> how do I look? How was what I said? How am I doing? 
We need to hear the opinions of others because we are domesticated and we can be ma manipulated by those opinions. That's why we seek recognition from other people. We need emotional support from other people. We need to be accepted by the outside dream by other people. This is why teenagers drink alcohol, take drugs, start smoking. It's just to be accepted by other people who have all the, those opinions. It is just to be considered cool. So many humans are suffering because of all the false images we try to project. Humans pretend to be something very important, but at the same time, we believe we are nothing. We work so hard to be someone that society someone in that society dream to be recognized and approved by others we try so hard to be important to be a winner to be powerful to be rich to be famous to express our personal dream and to impose our dream onto other people around us why because humans believe the dream is real we take it very seriously no one's bothered us i'm just going to keep reading it for you all. <laughs> i'm sure they will in just a minute Okay. Well, I'm at least going to go for one more chapter. Chapter 2, The Loss of Innocence. Humans by nature are very sensitive beings. We are so emotional because we perceive everything with the emotional body. The emotional body is like a radio that can be turned to perceive certain frequencies, tuned to perceive certain frequencies, or to react to certain frequencies. The normal frequency of humans before domestication is to explore and to enjoy life. We are tuned to love. As children, we don't have any definition of love but an abstract concept we just live love it's the way we are we don't have any definition of it as an abstract concept we just live love the emotional body has a component like an alarm system to let us know when something is wrong it is the same with the physical body it has an alarm system to let us know when something is wrong with our body we call this pain when we feel pain, it is because there's something wrong with the body that we have to look at to fix. The alarm system for the emotional body is fear. When we feel fear, it is because there's something wrong. Because perhaps we are in danger of losing our life. The emotional body perceives emotions, but not through the eyes. We perceive emotions through our emotional body. Children just feel emotions, and their reasoning mind doesn't interpret or question them. That is why children accept certain people and reject others. That is... That is, oh, when they don't feel confident around someone, they reject that person because they can feel the emotions that person is projecting. Children can easily perceive when someone is angry, and their alarm system generates a little fear that says stay away, and they follow their instincts. They stay away. We learn to be emotional according to the emotional energy in our home and our personal reaction to that energy. That is why every brother and sister will react differently according to how they learned to defend themselves and adapt to different circumstances. When our parents are constantly fighting, when there is disharmony, disrespect, and lies, we learn the emotional way of being like them. Even when they teach us not to be that way and try to tell us not to be that way, the emotional energy of our parents, of our entire family, will make us perceive the world in a similar way. The emotional energy that lives in our home is going to tune our emotional body to that frequency. The emotional body starts to change its tune, and it is no longer the normal tune of the human being, tuned to love. We play the game of the adults. We play the game of the outside dream, and we lose. We lose our innocence. We lose our freedom. We lose our happiness, and we lose our tendency to love. We are forced to change, and we start perceiving another world, another reality, the reality of injustice, the reality of emotional pain, the reality of emotional poison. Welcome to hell, the hell that humans create, which is the dream of the planet. We are welcomed into hell, but we don't in invent it personally. It was here before we were born. You can see how real love and freedom are destroyed by looking at children. Imagine a child, two or three years old, running and having fun in the park. Mom is there watching the little guy. She's afraid he might fall and hurt himself. At a certain point, she wants to stop him, and the child thinks Mom is playing with him, and he tries to run faster from her. Cars are passing in the street nearby, which makes Mom even more afraid. And finally, she catches him. The child is expecting her to play, and she spanks him. Boom. It's a shock. The child's happiness was the expression of love coming out of him, and he does not understand why she is acting this way. This is a shock that stops love little by little, little over time. The child does not understand words, but even so, he can question why. Running and playing is an expression of love, but it is no longer safe because your parents punish you when you express your love. They send you to your room. You cannot do what you want to do. They tell you that you are being a bad boy or a bad girl, and, this, and, put you, and that puts you down, and 
that means punishment. In that system of reward and punishment, there is a sense of justice and injustice. Oh, what is fair and what is not fair? The sense of injustice is like a knife that opens an emotional wound in the mind. Then, according to our reaction to the injustice, the wound may get infected with emotional poison. Why do some wounds get infected? Let's look at another example. Imagine that you are two or three years old. You are happy. You are playing. You are exploring. You aren't conscious of what isn't good or bad or right or wrong, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing because you are not yet domesticated. You are playing in the living room with whatever is around you. You don't have any bad intentions. You don't try to hurt anything, but you are playing with your daddy's guitar. For you, it's just a toy. You don't try to hurt your daddy at all. But your father is having one of those days when he doesn't feel right. He has problems in his business. He goes into the living room, finds you playing with his things, gets mad right away, and he grabs you and spanks you. This is injustice from your point of view. Your father just comes with anger and hurts you. This was someone you trusted completely because he is your daddy, someone who usually protects you and allows you to play and allows you to be you. Now there is something that doesn't quite fit. That sense of injustice is like a pain in your heart. You feel sensitive, it hurts and makes you cry. But you cry not just because he spanks you. It's not just the physical aggression that hurts you, it's the emotional aggression you feel is not fair. You didn't do anything. That sense of injustice opens a wound in your mind. Your emotional body is wounded. And in that moment, you lose a little part of your innocence. You learn that you cannot always trust your father, even if your mind doesn't know that yet, because your mind doesn't analyze. It still understands, I cannot trust. Your emotional body tells you that there is something that you cannot trust, and that something can be repeated. Your reaction might be fear, your reaction might be anger, or it might be shy, or just crying. But that reaction is hardly emotional poison is already emotional poison that reaction is already emotional poison because the normal rea normal reaction before domestication is that your daddy spanks you and you want to hit him back you hit him back or just intend to put your hand up and that makes your father even madder at you the reaction of your father for just putting your hand up against him creates a worse punishment now you know he will destroy you now you are afraid of him you no longer defend yourself because you know it will only make things worse you still don't understand why, but you know your father can even kill you. This opens a fierce wound in your mind. Before this, your mind was completely healthy. You were completely innocent. After this, the reasoning mind tries to do something with the experience. You learn to react in a certain way, your personal way. You keep the emotion with you, and it changes your way of life. This experience will repeat itself more often now. The injustice will come from mom and dad, brothers and sisters, from aunts and uncles, from school, from society, from everyone. With each fear, you learn to defend yourself, but not the way you did before domestication, when you would defend yourself and just keep playing. Now there is something inside you, the wound that at first is not a big problem, emotional poison. The emotional poison accumulates, and the mind begins to play with that poison. Now we start to worry a little about the future because we have a memory of the poison, and we don't want that to happen again. We also have memories of being accepted. We remember mom and dad being good to us and living in harmony. We want the harmony, but we don't know how to create it. And because we are inside the bubble of our own perception, whatever happens around us now seems as if it's because of us. We believe mom and dad fight because of us, even if it didn't have anything to do with us. Little by little, we lose our innocence. We start to feel resentment. We, then we no longer forgive. Over time, these incidents and in interactions let us know it is not safe to be who we really are. Of course, this is, of course, this will all vary intensely with each human according to his intelligence and his education. It will depend on many things. If you are lucky, the domestication is not that strong, but if you are not so lucky, the domestication be can be so strong and the wounds so deep that you can even be afraid to speak. The result is, oh, I am shy. Shyness is the fear of expressing yourself. You may believe you don't know how to dance or how to sing, but this is just repression of the normal human instinct to express love. Humans use fear to domesticate humans, and our fear increases with each experience of injustice. The sense of injustice is a knife that opens a wound in our emotional body. Emotional poison is created by our reaction to what we consider injustice. Some wounds will heal. Others will become infected with more and more poisons. Once we are full, the emotional poisons 
Once we are full of emotional poisons, we have the need to release it, and we practice releasing the poison by sending it to someone else. How do we do this? By hooking that person's attention. Let's take an example of an ordinary couple. For whatever reason, the wife is mad. She has a lot of emotional poison from an injustice that can't, can't cut, that comes from her husband. The husband is not home, but she remembers that injustice, and the poison is growing inside. When the husband comes home, the first thing she wants to do is hook his attention, because once she hooks his attention, all the poison can go to her husband, and she can have some relief. As soon as she tells him how bad he is, how stupid, or how unfair he is, that poison she had inside of her is transferred to the husband. She keeps talking and talking until she gets his attention. The husband finally reacts and gets mad, and she feels better. But now the poison is going through him, and he has to get it out. He has to hook her attention and release the poison. But it's not just her poison. It's her poison plus his poison. If you look at this interaction, you will see that they are touching each other's wounds and playing ping pong with emotional poison. The poison keeps growing and growing until someday one of them is going to explode. This is often how humans relate to each other. By hooking the attention, the energy goes from one person to another person. The attention is something very powerful in the human mind. Everyone around the world is hunting the attention of others all the time. When we capture the attention, we create channels of communication. The dream is transferred, the power is transferred, but the emotional poison is transferred also. Until we release the poison with the person we think is responsible for the injustice. But if that person is so powerful that we cannot send it to him, we don't care who we send it to. We send it to the little ones who have no defense against us. And that is how abusive relationships are formed. The people of power abuse the people who have less power because they need to release their emotional poison. We have the need to release the poison, and sometimes we don't want justice. We want the release. We want peace. That is why humans are hunting power all the time, because the more powerful we are, the easier it is to release the poison to the ones who cannot defend themselves. Of course, we are talking about relationships in hell. We are talking about the mental disease that exists on this planet. There is no one to blame for this disease. It is not good or bad, right or wrong. It is simply the normal pathology of this disease. No one is guilty for being abusive, just as on the Im imaginary planet, just as people on the imaginary planet are not guilty because their skin is sick. You are not guilty because you have wounds infected with poison. When you are physically sick or injured, you don't blame yourself or feel guilty. Then why feel bad or feel guilty? Because your emotional body is sick. What is the importance to have the awareness that we have this problem? If we have the awareness, we have the opportunity to heal our emotional body, our emotional mind, and stop suffering. Without awareness, there is nothing we can do. The only thing we can do is keep suffering from the interaction with other humans, <clears throat> but not just with other humans, the interaction with our own self, because we also touch our own wounds just to be punished. In our mind, we create that part of us that is always judging. The judge is judging everything we do, everything we don't do, everything we feel, everything we don't feel. We are judging ourselves all the time, and we are judging everyone else all the time, based on what we believe and based on the scene and based on the sense of justice and injustice. Of course, we find ourselves guilty, and we need to be punished. And the other part of our mind that receives the judgment that has the need to be punished is the victim. That part of us says, poor me, I am not good enough, I am not strong enough, I am not intelligent enough, why should I try? When you were a child, you could not choose what to believe and what not to believe. The judge and the victim are based on all of those false beliefs you didn't choose. When that information went into your mind, you were innocent. You believed everything. The belief system was put inside you like a program by the outside dream. The Toltecs call this program the parasite. Now we're getting into the good shit. The human mind is sick because it has a parasite that steals its vital energy and robs it of joy. The parasite is all those beliefs that make you suffer. The beliefs are so strong that years later when you learn new concepts and try to make your own decisions, you find those beliefs still control your life. Sometimes the little child inside you comes out, the real you that stays at the age of two or three years old. I call it the baby self. You are living in the moment and having fun, but there is something pulling you back. Something inside feels unworthy of having too much fun. An inner voice tells you that your happiness is too good to be true. It isn't right to be happy. 
all the guilt, all the blame, all the emotional poison in your emotional body keeps pulling you back into the world of drama. The parasite spreads like a disease from our grandparents to our parents to ourselves and then we give it to our children. We put all those programs inside our children the same way we train a dog. Humans are domesticated animals and this, this domestication leads us to the dream of hell where we live in fear. The food for the parasite is the emotions that come from fear. Boom! It's said. I like to say they're feeding on our dense energy because the dense energy, it's 414 my time, is this really tight energy. But the food for the parasite is the emotions that come from fear. Before we get the parasite, we enjoy life. We play, we are happy like children. But after all that garbage is put into our minds, we are no longer happy. We learn to be right and to make everyone else wrong. The need to be right is the result of trying to protect the image we want to protect to the outside world. And it's also seeking approval. Let's just say that. We have to impose our way of thinking, not just onto other humans, but upon, even upon ourselves. With awareness, we can easily understand why relationships don't work with our parents, with our children, with our friends, with our partner, and even with ourselves. Why doesn't this relationship work with ourselves? Because we are wounded and we have all that emotional poison that we can hardly handle. We are full of poison because we grew up with the image of perfection that is not true, which does not exist in our mind. It isn't fair. We have seen how we create that image of perfection to please other people, even though they create their own dream that has nothing to do with us. We try to please mom and dad. We try to please our teacher, our minister, our religion, and God. But the truth is that from their point of view, we are never going to be perfect. That image of perfection tells us how we should be in order to acknowledge that we are good in order to accept ourselves. But guess what? This is the biggest lie we believe about ourselves because we are never going to be perfect. And there is no way that we can forgive ourselves for not being perfect. The image of perfection changes the way that we dream. We learn to deny ourselves and reject ourselves. We are never good. I need to stop for a second because in all honesty, once you surrender good, bad, right, wrong, and you're not viewing through that paradigm anymore, and once you accept that you are divine energy spark inside powering your avatar, powering this avatar, then you, you totally, you do, then you are perfect. You are existing in your perfected state, just as God source created you to get to know itself through you. So, there's my little, but, yeah, okay. <clears throat> the image of perfection changes the way that we dream. We learn to deny, our, deny ourselves and reject ourselves. We are never good enough or right enough or clean enough or healthy enough according to all of those beliefs that we have. There is always something to judge, to ju the judge can never accept or forgive. That is why we reject our own humanity. That is why we never deserve to be happy. That is why we are searching for someone who abuses us, someone who will punish us. We have a very high level of self-abuse because of that image of perfection. When we reject ourselves and judge ourselves and find ourselves guilty and punish ourselves so much, it looks like there is no love. It looks like there is only punishment, only suffering, only judgment in the world. Hell has many different levels. Some people are very deep in hell and others are hardly in hell, but still they are in hell. They are very abusive relations. They are. There are very abusive relationships in hell and relationships with hardly any abuse. You are no longer a child, and if you have an abusive relationship, it is because you accept that abuse, because you believe you deserve it. You have a limit to the amount of abuse you will accept, but no one in the whole world abuses you more than you abuse yourself. The limit of your self-abuse is the limit you will tolerate from another person. If someone abuses you more than you abuse yourself, you walk away, you run, you escape. But if someone abuses you a little less than you abuse yourself, perhaps you stay longer. You still deserve that abuse. Usually in a normal relationship in hell, it's about payment for an injustice. It's about getting even. I abuse you the way you need to be abused, and you abuse me the way I need to be abused. We have a good equilibrium. It works. Of course, energy attracts the same kind of energy, <laughs> the same vibration. If someone comes to you and says, oh, I am so abused, and you ask, well, why do you stay there? He doesn't even know why. The truth is he needs that abuse because that is the way he punishes himself. Life brings, you to, a, life brings, you, brings to you exactly what you need. There is perfect justice in hell. There is nothing to blame. 
We can even say that our suffering is a gift. If you just open your eyes and see what is around you, it's exactly what you need to clean your poison, to heal your wounds, to accept yourself, and to get out of hell. I gotta go pee, but I'll be right back.